filter updates since the last NetFilter, uh, not NetFilter workshop, sorry, the last Net uh, conference um, that happened six months ago. So this is not a specifically a tutorial, so for those that are not familiar with NF tables yet, um, I'm going to refer to the documentation that is available on the website. Um, it's basically wiki nftables.org. Uh, it's starting to get quite complete. We have a, we have um, users requesting uh, accounts on the on the wiki page um, that are starting to 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 extend the documentation examples and so it's starting to look quite 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 nice in my opinion. Now we have also the man page. Um, so not not expecting a tutorial specifically here. I'm going to make incremental updates on what is going on. Um, also, those updates are going to be related with the NetFilter workshop. It's a, in, it's a um, very small conference that happens once a year. To where it's a meeting basically where all NetFilter developers meet uh, to talk about ongoing development efforts. And this time it happened uh, a few months ago in Faro in Portugal. And we had a, we had really a nice time there actually, and we made quite a lot of progress in all the discussions we had. And and I'm going to show you also a bit of performance numbers. Uh, the performance numbers I'm going to show you are has been obtained through the uh, PKTGM bench XMIT mode native receive that long, long name is a script that resides on samples PKTGM folder in the Linux kernel tree. And and basically the results um, they they I mean they, they are observed from one single CPU and we are also, we are considering the smallest packet size so it's the worst case. So as I said, um, this is not a tutorial so you have the documentation uh, for those that don't know NF tables re is replacing the existing IP IP6 EB tables IP tables. And we have a new release that happened uh, just a few weeks ago, three weeks ago. It's NFTable 0.8. It has included 300, around 300 uh, commits since last time. And we got 20, 20, uh, 26 uh, contributors, so we have doubled the, the number we had last time. Well, in, ter in terms of performance, uh, dropping packets using the new ingress hook is twice faster. Um, and this is just showing um, the, the, the rule above. I mean, it's just there just to draw packets at the routing chain. The, the table is raw, so it's quite quite early in the in the AP tables uh, pipeline, and we, we are getting around six million packets per second. But with NF tables, we get double. Um, if we use a a set that was including 384, the number is. I mean, if we could we could even include more. The, the number would be exactly the same because basically behind behind that rule is is the bitmap set that is being used. So it's basically almost quite quite close to to dropping one single one single port. It's um, so let's talk about. The updates that happened on the set infrastructure, so there were some there was some 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 changes that went to went upstream, related to to, to make to make NF tables go faster in um, uh, for the set implementations that we have. So for those that are not familiar, basically in NF tables, uh, we um, the the from user space what we provide is a description of of. Of the of the set, it's not specifically that we select. We allow the user to select what what backend wants to use. Not, uh, but but we instead we the user needs to provide the number of elements that are going uh, that is going to 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 add to the set. It's this is of course optional, right? But if if this information, if these indications are passed to the kernel, the kernel can make a better decision because it's it's the kernel that is deciding what set backend is going to be used. So it's not that we allow the user to say, I want a hash table. It's, it's more like um, you just describe what you want, and the kernel has a routine to select what, what is the best backend for you. And there are two policies, performance and memory. Depending on all the trade-offs you select, 
it's going to also to, to change the, 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 set, uh, the set backend. And all that happens because we have a big O notation. It's basically an enum, an enumeration. It's an attack that, that allows us to, to classify the different, the different set backend implementations that we have. More descriptions that, that are available are the key length. Um, and just in case that we want intervals, this is also important. Um, to make the selection. Uh, the set backend implementations that we have are basically three at this moment. It's the hash table. There are two variants, a fixed hash table and a resizable hash table. There is a, a bitmap that supports up to 16, 16 uh, bit keys at this moment. Um, and uh, it's going to be always like that, otherwise it's going to consume too much memory. But we could, we could also, we are also planning to support ranges, so sort of we could we could use the bitmap again to just to to build a small uh, bitmap for some IP range, for example, indicating the, the both sides of the of the interval, right? So and and then we have the the red black tree just for uh, interval based prefixes and so on. So evaluating performance of the hash table, um, just considering one single rule with a constant constant set. So by constant set, I, I, I'm, I'm referring to set that, that we assume that the, the, the number of elements are not going to change. So with the resizable implementation, we are getting uh, 11 million packets per second. This is again uh, dropping packets at, at ingress, right? So with a fixed hash table, we are, it's just, it was just 150 more lines of code. So it was not much. It was simply an implementation of a fixed uh, size hash table. And basically what we got is with uh, a constant set that looks like that. It, this is basically that command there. It's allowing us to add um, an element to uh, table X and set Y with these three elements. So basically the user indicates the size either explicitly or, imp or implicitly. If it's implicitly, it's just by providing the number of elements. And if it's explicitly, it's going to happen by, by using the size statement inside, inside the set definition. You see that rule that says NFT at set x, y. And then type, so this is basically specifying the data type of elements that are going to be stored in that set. And then the size is, is explicitly telling the kernel that this set is not going to have more than 128 elements. So all those indications, as I said, are useful to the kernel. In that case, it's going to select the fixed size hash table. So, uh, and then inside the kernel, we have two, two, different, two different lookup functions. There are two optimized for 62-bit and 32-bit keys. That is a slightly faster than the one that is for keys that are larger than 32-bit key. The, the, the one, the larger the 32-bit key is basically using main compare. So that's, what, that's the reason why the 16 and 32 B key is faster. So we, we kind of have variants of the of, of the look at of the look at functions to, to perform to perform to perform, to search for the element that we want to find in this in this set. The bitmap um, the bitmap uh, keeps a list of existing dummy objects. Uh, this dummy objects are there to store comments and in the future to support timeouts too. Timeouts are another feature that, are, that, are, that is available in, in the set infrastructure. Basically it allows us to, um, to let elements expire. So you can populate a set with elements, run time, and then after some point if we, if we see no packets hitting that element, it's going to, just going to release the, the, the element from the set. This is not, so this timeout feature is not available in the, set, in the bitmap but it should be possible by using this dummy list of objects. This dummy list of objects is there because, I mean, a bitmap, the elements are compressed, right? So, but to store, we can, we can place comments on every element, or we can have this timeout. So in, that, in that case, we cannot store that in a compressed representation, right? So that's why we have a list of these dummy objects that are going to store these extra made information, state information that, that we cannot store in the compressed mode, right? So, so um, this list is obviously you not know, used from the packet path. From the packet path, we look up for matchings using the bitmap. So this is only useful from when, when dumping back to user space the elements that are stored in the set. 
and and what, what we the, the the performance number are uh, are quite good, uh, better than hash table and and the red black tree that I th I'm going to show you uh, in the next slide. So it's 16 uh, million packets per second. It's quite good. Um, and as I said, we can only select this bitmap in case that keys are smaller than 16 bits. Um, um, the red black tree is an implementation that allows us to store ranges. Um, ranges are quite quite um, quite useful feature. There are many people maintaining blacklists or whitelists on the on the internet these days, right? So basically, uh, it's um, logarithmic complexity. So with two ranges, the more ranges we have in the tree, it's going to it's going to slightly go down in performance. Um, uh, it's anyway. It's it's it, it, it now it is now logless. There was a, a central spin lock um, uh, that we now removed using uh, David um, Howell's idea of, for RP, RP, RPC. It's basically something that Eric Dumas had mentioned during the, during the last NetFilter workshop. Basically, we have a fast path where where, where we can perform logless. Um, search on the RB3, but if there is any operation to update the RB3 uh, going on, then then we we, we just um, basically we we can see that that is going on through sec lock, and then we fall back to the slow path. So it's it's very rare that we are going to enter the slow path, and we relay on keep relaying on this red black team implementation. Um, so those are basically the three set backends representation that we have at this stage that we've been lately uh, optimizing to achieve better numbers. Um, in terms of features, there are new features available in NF tables. Um, and now it's possible to use the FIP expression for those that, that are familiar with this new expression. This basically allows us to inquire the FIP um, Engine to with with it's it's actually very very flexible. So you have a you have a tuple that that you can use dif different component to inquire the FIP, and and you can specify also what kind of result result you want to fetch from from the FIP. For example, the first rule above it's basically based on 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 a tuple composed of the source address and the input interface. It's just asking for uh, if it's asking for uh, the output interface, if it exists or, or not, the missing says there is no output interface. So in that case, I'm going to, we are going to drop the traffic. Um, and then the, the other example is a bit more elaborated using a map. So taking taking the destination and drag and then mark, and then based on the result of that, on the type of entry that we get in the FIP, is it a black code, private, private? Or unreachable, we are going to perform an action on the packet. So um, the, the main the main work this this is work that, that Florian already made. But the, the 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 new thing here is that basically Pablo Bermudo that has been working under the the Google Summer of Code program he added the support for this at the ingress hook. So we can now perform the main feature for this. It's the early is, is reverse is reverse path filtering. So we can perform earlier reverse reverse path filtering. Not needed to do this in in pro routing anymore. Um, and ag again, access all the features that this powerful fit expression uh, provides. Um, also, Florian he he's been working on on adding the the TCP option matching and mangling. So so now we can match any any TCP option and we can also mangle them. This is specifically useful. For the maximum segment size mangling, uh, specifically for DSL or I mean DSL lines or the fiber lines also encapsulating uh, using um, PPPoE, right? And those those needs to to adjust, adjust the maximum segment size in, in TCP traffic not to break. So we we, we allow we allow also to to say a a fixed value. But this is this is the more flexible way. I mean, this is basically going to consult the routing, the, the MSS from the route entry um, in the forwarding base, and and based on that, it's going to say the maximum segment size. So um, 
what else? Um, um, now, we, we used to have a limit of 32 uh, bytes for all objects that we have in NFT tables, for tables, chains, and sets, and, and also for the stable, stable objects. This is no longer uh, like this. We, we have extended this to 200, 255. The reason why is that there are users asking to, to map, to, to, to place DNS names in their sets. So basically the idea is that they, they have some sort of daemon that is, is, is just pulling for names and, and populating the sets. Um, so, so this is, this is a, a, a way to, so they can just use their, fil the, their rule set, they can, they can use names instead, uh, instead of IP addresses. Um, uh, we recommend this way because we don't want to give the user the wrong impression that they can actually filter based on names. In, in, in IP tables, it was, it was, this was kind of sloppy and it was causing, causing quite a lot of confusion. Basically, users were relying on this feature and IP tables was expanding uh, a rule with a name with every IP address we were resolving uh, at command, at command runtime, and that was not good. So, so with this approach, people at least we ex we expect that users are going to be aware of what they're doing, right? So exp explicitly defining a set and and all these things. So um, we now display a generation ID and process that has modified the rule set. We have two commit phase protocol. So basically, uh, what it happens uh, if we use NFT monitor is that if there is a transaction that is commit by other process, we are going to receive the table, chain, and new rules, sets, whatever objects have, has been added. And then there is a line that, that indicates um, the new generation that has happened and the process, the, P, the, the process ID and the, and the, and the name. So, what else? Um, now we have support for the limit stateful object. Um, before, before the previous net then we only had two types, it's counters and quotas. These stateful objects are, are, very, are very interesting feature. Basically what, what, what this allows you to attach a name to a counter quota or limit and you can, you can just atomically um, dump and reset a, a given counter. Um, you can also you, you can also um, specify a name to, to a given quota and reset it also atomically. Um, and a, a, missing, a missing feature that we would like to have soon is to update those objects uh, um, by, for example, without, without, without having to, to reload the rule set. Basically, the idea is that the user uh, specify what object wants to update uh, the, 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 the configuration. Let's say, for example, I want to write the rate limit for this object, it's without, without needing to reload the rule, the rule set, it's going to be applying a different rate limit for that object. So this is, this is missing, but it's at least the, 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 main, the main pieces are now in place upstream. So now you can just add uh, a limit object. This is a first line is adding a lim one object with, uh, with that uh, given rate limit. And the second one is another limit is 1,024 kilobyte seconds with a burst also. And then we can use these objects from, from rules. So you can also, uh, the nice thing is that you can, you can use these stateful objects from, from maps. So the rule there, it's adding a rule at the t table filter chain per routing. And you have limit name, and the name is going to be selected based on, on what we look up from the map. The key to, to look up for the limit that we're going to apply is based on the TCP destination port. So in case that the packet is going to TCP destination port uh, 443, so we apply the limit lim, lim one. Okay. There is, there is now a dry run mode. Support for this in the kernels has been around for a while. It was missing in NFT. Basically, there is a new minus minus check option that you can place in front of a rule or also when loading a rule set uh, uh, via NFT minus F. So the idea is, is that um, we, we, push, we push the changes we want into the kernel. 
So we have a, in NF tables, we have two phase commit protocols. So we have a preparation phase and we have the commit phase, right? So what is going on is that we push the, the updates to the kernel and the kernel is going to do all the preparation phase and we don't send the commit message to the kernel. So the kernel, uh, if, if the commit message, the, the commit message is miss, missing, it's just basically going to roll back. So all the changes that we do in that rule are going to be done in the preparation phase and then when entering the commit phase, there is no commit command. So the kernel says, okay, I have to roll back. So this, this is useful in case that you want to check if your rule set or your incremental update is going to apply to what you have without, without actually performing any, any update on it. Yes? How do you So you want to you want to test if if uh, if the rule is there or if. I see. So that is testing whether the rule is the Yes, this is testing if if this rule would would be added. I mean, it, it is testing if if the table X exists, if the chain Y exists, and if there is any reference to, for example, the TCP chain exists, also the UDP chain exists. So it's basically validating that the rule would apply cleanly to the. Okay. So same thing for, for the for the check for to, to add the element is just going to check if if uh, there is a table X that exists a a, a, tab, a set that set that exists too, and if we actually use if we use instead of add we use create. Um, create is um, the kernel base out if if that element exists already if you use create instead of add right so it's basically uh, having the same semantics that we have in Netlink. So if you uh, specify create and you use minus minus check and that element exists already, you are going to you are going to have a a element already exists message. Okay, so it's basically this allows us just to test. Okay, uh, if the rule if the rule will apply cleanly. There is also now wildcard support from NF tables scripts. Uh, the um, uh, the, the NF table script support is quite quite in early state, but it's something that we want to 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 develop. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you we we have more. We've been discussing uh, more ideas to integrate into the scripting capabilities that we have. But now something that we got upstream is a change from Ismo Pustina. It's developer working for Intel. Basically, um, the idea is, is he wanted to have he wanted to have wildcard support. So now, if you just specify a wildcard inside a folder, it's just going to take all the files in that folder. It's going to be including that in alphanumeric order. So, you, 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 so the user gets a deterministic way to know what is going to be loaded and what, in what order you are going to lo load all the, the, the policies that you have split in different files, right? So this is quite, quite convenient. I mean, splitting your policy in the different files is quite convenient because it's, there are things in your rule set that ch sometimes change dynamically in case that you, you keep blacklist or whitelist, right? So you can keep in, in files part of your rules that are static that are going, not going to change and then other parts that you want to change that are probably the generated dynamically by some daemon, right? Or some script so that is running in a cron job. So that, that, that is now upstream, and now we have also the eco option. The eco option is basically exposing the, the Netlink eco flag semantics. It's, it's an option to, um, to, print, to print exactly what the kernel has added, and, and specifically this allows us to, to fetch the unique handle. Every rule comes with a unique handle number. This unique handle number is uh, useful to make sure that we are referring to the same rule a long time because you know robots they can be adding on related rules and if you want to make sure that the rule that you're consulting is exactly the same and not not another version of the rule that just was just was added later on you can just uh, check this handle number with that we don't have handle numbers for tables chains and sets so far but we are planning for that too. So, so this equal flag is basically when you add the command, it's just printing the handle number that that, that we that we um, that we got from the kernel. During the filter workshop, we've been talking about Frem. Frem is I, I don't know if you know this project, but 
uh, it's, it's, it's good to have a look at it. Um, FRAM is around since 2001. If you, I mean, it's quite easy to, to realize that FRAM has been, NF table has been quite inspired by, by, by FRAM, right? So it's, there are many things in FRAM that, that looks very similar in NFT, and NFT came later on. So, um, but the thing is that FRAM it was, was made in, 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 in Perl, and it's, it's, it's actually using uh, IP tables in, in, to generate the rules. So it's, it's, it's a, a translation layer, basically. You, they, it has its own syntax, and the, the syntax that you have in, in FRAM is going to be expanded into IP tables commands. So FRAM comes with, with set support, but those for, for each element, it's going to expand, expand one rule. So the bad thing about FRAM is that the user is not quite aware of the number of rules that, that you are placing in your rule set. But some people uh, like it because it's, it, it's reducing the complexity that you have to deal with when maintaining an IP tables rule set. Um, FRAM also comes with, with uh, features that are available in NF tables, like inclusion of files. And it, it comes with quite a lot of advanced uh, scripting capabilities that we would like to have. This is not yet available in NFT, but it's something that we would like to have at some point. This is the main features that we consider useful in the NetFilter workshop. So um, one of them is, is to allow to, we have in NF tables, we have support to define uh, variables. Uh, we would like to, to have support to, to define this variable from, from the command line. So we would need to have something like NFT minus minus dev, and then you specify your variable name and your value. So in case that you have a variable in your rule set, it's, it's not that you have to define inside the file the value of that rule set. We can do it from from the command line, right? Um, another feature that is quite useful is, um, is, is this interactive mode that a firm has. It's basically allowing us to test if a uh, rule set is not locking you out from the system. It's very useful for system administrator, DevOps, basically, that are updating a rule set remotely and that want to make sure that that uh, rule set is not locking you out, right? So it's basically just um, printing a question like, would you like to apply the rule set after, after just typing in firm minus minus interactive? And you can specify a timeout. If you say yes, then it applies the rule set. Otherwise, if you don't say yes, it's just going to roll back and take you to the previous um, situation. So if, in case that you are on a SSH session, you are going to recover control on the system, right? Quite useful. So this is something that we would like to have. The external command invocations are, um, so firm comes with, um, with this backtick thing. It's basically, um, you can invoke commands. For example, if, in case that you have a variable to set the DNS server's IP address, and you want to extract that from etcresolve.com, so you can just invoke that command and then place that value into the variable and then use it from the rule. Uh, there has been quite, quite a bit of work that has been done on to provide a high level library, the NLIB NF tables. Um, that is initial support for a simple API. This simple API um, basically allows us to, what you, what you, ha what you have to do is just create it a context object that is basically keeping all the states behind the uh, scanner, parser, evaluation, evaluation steps, and, and finally pushing the command to the, to the kernel. Um, so it's basically keeping behind the curtain all these states, this, this, uh, contract, uh, this, cont this context object. And then there is a very simple command, is NFT run command from buffer. You just pass the context and you pass the string and the size of that string, and then you, you, you get a result of the command. We, we plan to support also batching. So we've been discussing a batching API, so the idea is that you, you keep adding uh, new commands to a batch, and now your batch is ready. You just call NFT run batch, and it's going to push that batch into the kernel. Um, so the idea is that for these high level APIs that the user express things in, in, the, in the NFT syntax, and this API just allows you to to push commands into the kernel. Um, 
there are quite a, quite a bit of things to be done to provide a more advanced API uh, and to have co full control of Nelling IO. This is, this is more for more advanced users. So what we would like to have is, the, is that the library provides a very, very simple API for those that are, uh, don't know anything about uh, Netlink details or kernel details. And at the same time, we would like to also provide an API that is quite flexible and quite powerful and allows you to do very advanced features. So those that don't want to know much about um, implementation details about NF tables, they can just um, integrate a third party application to, to add new rules into the kernel and, and there you go. So we are also planning for our more advanced API. You get new soon. This API is still not exposed, so there are all the changes that have happened in this are in the tree, but we just need to expose the API. That is a very small patch, so we will have soon some example file, and, and this, will be, this will be available in the next uh, NFT version, basically, this, this lib NF tables high level library. What else? Um, on the contract side, there has been quite a bit of updates from uh, by Florian. Um, so basically, it's speeding up net namespace removal by by selected calls to synchronize uh, net. Uh, many of these calls has been happening one after another every time that we were we were removing a net namespace. So now now this is batch, and we just call once. And just, this is a speed in removal. And uh, what else? Um, this, this connection, the, the connection tracking extension infrastructure have been simplified. So we have basically um, the main NFT, NF contract object, NF con object. And this object uh, was containing um, fields that are accessed all, all the time. And there were extensions that were actually accessed almost all the time that were placed out of the main memory, the main area where we represent the contract object. So the, this was slow, and in terms of locality, it was not exploiting locality quite good. And also another problem is that um, we were also in the initial packets, we were spending quite a, quite a bit of cycles calculating the extension area. So it's so we, we are just basically recovering the balance. So we kind of overdo a bit with abstractions, and now we are rolling back a bit just to, it's not that we remove we got this infrastructure removed. It, the, the extensions are still there. But now in the NFCon uh, object, we have the fields that are, user, e, e, that are useful for most users all the time. Um, and then the things that are RAR are still kept in, in RAR or slow path, are still kept in the extension infrastructure. For example, all the, the, the helper, the connection tracking helper infrastructure all those ALG, right? They, they are considered to be a slow path. They are parsing the strings and so on. So we, we keep all that in the, in the connection tracking extension infrastructure. So um, he also reduced the memory footprint by, by using a smaller A rise all over the place. Uh, now the contract object is a main change. Um, that is that contract hooks are registered once we explicitly, we, we provide an indication that we are going to use the states that are available in, in contract, so if you have a, if you add a rule with min, with uh, minus m state, then the contract ho hooks are registered. And this is basically just to save save cycles. On uh, this was specifically a problem with net name spaces because we you have lots of them. Contract if only one net net name space was uh, registering was needing contract, it was registered for for them all. Then we move to a situation where we have uh, pair net namespace hooks, but but again, if only one of them needs contract, it was getting registered for all of them, and now we basically only register them if you explicitly need it. So it's it's the best the best approach that that what we have now upstream, right? In terms of of, of performance. Um, there is now a new approach to get rid of unassured flows for DCCP, SCTP, and TCP flows. It's basically contract when it is under stress, meaning that um, all the, the, the slots that we have in the table is getting full. So there is a garbage collector thread that is going, or going it's, it's spinning over the table, searching for flows that are not assured, basically that are not 
we, the, 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 the flow has not been fully established, right? And we are getting rid of them. So that, those are the candidates in, 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 in case of stress situation. We, we have no more fake contract object anymore for no tracking, for better cash efficiency. And also there has been quite a bit of bugs that has been solved by Leaping Sank in terms of uh, hash table resizing. We have a routine that allows us to resize the connection tracking table runtime. And, and now those are fixed. So something else I wanted to talk about um, in, the Netflix, in, a, in, in this workshop is the, the flow of load infrastructure. There is a patch set that I sent previous week. Um, basically, the idea is to add a generic software flow table representation. This flow table representation is going to hook in the NetFilter hook ingress. And um, the idea is that for each packet that, that hits the, 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 the software flow table, we are going to check if there is an entry. If there is an entry, then we know what is the port where we should just forward the packet. Uh, otherwise, we just follow the classic forwarding path. So if we have a hit, we're going to apply the, the, the NAT mangling. If there is any, we are going to decrement the TDL and just send it to the, to the right port using neighbor Smith. So we have a lazy approach to, to expire flows. Basically, there is this, this is more a stateless, a stateless thing. So we have a timeout for all the entries. The, that, timeout, that timeout is going to be the same for all the entries. And if we, if we see no more packets uh, um, hitting, hitting that entry in the flow table, it's going to let it expire. So what, what, what do you have to do if you want to use this new feature? It's, it's something that is configurable. So it's a user that has to explicitly request this. I've been observing for a while patches to do this transparently. Uh, for some small router vendors, it were patches that were applying to OpenWRT, and it was, in my opinion, it was not it was not right because it was, it's something that is going to get users confused because it's changing semantics in a way that that um, it's just going to get users confused really. So it's it's not going to work the way the users are are used to. So so now this is this is this is, this would be. This will be configurable. It's something that you have to specify in a rule. So in case that you want to uh, place um, TCP flows in, the, in, that, in that software flow table, you add a rule that says IP protocol TCP that is going to be offload, OK? And that counter is basically just to, to, to check for how many, how many flows are being hit by this rule, are being offloaded to the flow table. So when, when um, when having a look at, uh, at what, we, what we find in, in the contract table, we are going to have a new uh, status bit, this offload tag, that is going to say that this flow has been offload, has been placed into, into the flow table. And um, when benchmarking this software flow table representation, it's around three times faster, uh, basically. Um, um, Using again the, the same script that I mentioned before, the PKTG in bench XMIT mode, and exercise, exercising the, the forwarding path using dummy device, um, we were getting, as I said, three times more. It's from 1.8 1, 1. 1, 1. million packets per second to 5.1. So basically, all this is just because we are skipping. Uh, fit lookups for the flows, and we are skipping lots of lots of things that are basically happening in the in the standard forwarding path, right? So, so only the initial packets that establish the the, the 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 flow are are those that are going to be following the classic forwarding path. So, and all these match as well with with what we have in in switches and NICs. So, the, many of them they come they come with built-in flow tables. And as I said, I've been observing patches out of three to, to support this. Um, so what we could do is uh, this, this hardware flow table needs to be configured uh, from user's co user context. Uh, so this is not going to mix well with the fact that we have um, packets going in. Uh, for, uh, com it's not going to mix well with, with the fact that we, uh, if we try to configure this from the packet path from bottom half context, right? So what we need to do is, is we are going to schedule 
the, con the configuration through via, uh, via kernel, kernel thread, via work queue. And so a few packets are going to still be flowing through, through the software path. This is going to be consistent to the user because for some bit of time we are going to relay on the software flow table. And at some point, when we get the configuration in the hardware done, um, packets will, will follow the, the, the hardware path. Okay, so, so this is basically just because we, we, need, we need this kernel thread because we need to hold the MDIO, MDIO, MDIO matrix to, to, to configure this. Um, what can you do in the Single one, another um, Sorry? Why do you need two NDOs and a single NDO? Yeah, I could, I could use just single one and an enumeration. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, yes, NDO flow, flow offload, and say enum, enum. Yes? And, and the flow object, what do you have? Only the five tapa or also the connection information? Yes, I can show you. TCP window and everything, or? I can show you. Not the details, the concept. Yeah, but I can show you the, the mm -hmm. so that's basically the tuple. Right, can you see, I can, I can get it larger. Okay, so we, we have basically a tuple. It's just basically source and destination IP address and protocols, numbers, and port ID. This actually could be could be fairly hard to follow the tuple, right? Um, I will do that in a follow-up patch. But it, basically, what what this is storing is also we have a tuple for each direction, and it's storing it's storing the 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 address is also the, the NAT mangling that needs needs to happen. So it's not storing the TCP window. No, not yet. Okay, because you want okay you want all the possible also with the hardware. Yes, if we want to upload that to the hardware, yes. Then we need we need to extend this to say so the hardware needs to say needs to announce to the to the kernel that it supports that feature, so we can add the support for this. But I mean, initially with the hardware I'm working, uh, it's it's actually a very very small switch with only 4K 4K entries. So we just get the basic infrastructure in, and then we can extend in. Uh, this infrastructure to support more features, to, to support hardware that can do more things incrementally. That's mm -hmm. the idea. Can you use stuff that's not layer four? So, like for a hardware upload of container item, we just don't want to see any flows for these things. It's like seven straight So We don't want to wake up the main process of something. And uh, before we have to deal with some packets and the NAT and stuff, but for these things, just like plug in space to it. Yeah, this is something that is going, look at this as something that is going to integrate with all the features that we have in the kernel. I mean, yeah. if, if we are going to check if, if there is no X-Form, not, not thinking of Android, but thinking in general, if we have an X-Form policy, it's just going to skip this flow of load. If there is any uh, IP options, for example, there is CIPSO, uh, security instructions, oh no, I cannot offload this. I need, you need to follow the, the standard forwarding path. So, so this is also providing us a degree some degree of integration with all the features that we have, because we, if we, uh, for example, it's not going to be back, it's not going to break path into you either, um, because the the software forwarding path, the classic forwarding path, is going to, uh, with the initial packets, it's going to make sure that the MTUs are right. Otherwise, send the fragmentation needed to, to the to the to the to the, the endpoints, right, to the next endpoints, the, 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 and. So, because if we do all this in hardware, the hardware needs to have the bit path MPU capabilities. And for very simple hardware, it's not going to happen. So, um, yeah, ideally, it would be good to have everything exactly in hardware. But in practice, there are many corner cases that are, are just going to break things. So, it's a trade off. What's, what's the idea behind 
dealing with those, those common cases and the discrepancy between what maybe existed in IP tables for a long time versus what the maybe single family is kind of Are you going to try to reflect it somehow so that people can know how it doesn't need to be really like that? Or it's just try to be transparent and even No, transparent is, yeah. question is about uh, how do you uh, reflect differences between the hardware implementation and the software implementation. Uh, so if it's something like whether or not you have window tracking, I think this would be a feature uh, that the hardware should advertise somehow or can be queried. And, and if you ask for window tracking and the hardware doesn't support it, it's, it's disallowed. In the case of more subtle differences, um, I can't think of a particular example, but there must be many. Um, yeah, this is maybe a bit unsolved, but I think in general the idea of the opt-in is that you're saying, so when we say contract, what we're really talking about is a specific implementation of that that exists in the Linux kernel as of a certain version of the kernel. By saying I want to op offload or push the flow down to hardware, what you're saying is I want something that's like contract, and I'm, I'm acknowledging that it may not be the same. And as for how it differs and so on, yeah, that would be nice to know. <laughs> yeah, but the, this opt-in part of it is 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 a, the basic answer to this question, that, and that's why it's not transparent because it's not contract. Contract is as implemented by Linux. Is that right, Pablo? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, this is basically the material I have. If you have any other questions, yes? Um, how do you, um, so you can have the problem that you have to make these, you have the problem that you have to keep these flows straight out of the library. So what do you do? Do you like pull packets into the CPU and have occasionally do the software problem? Because what we do is we, the hardware basically sends a callback saying, hey, you know, this connection is still alive and we just use the net filter contract interface to be off the timers. Uh, but it sounds like this is a lot better than what we have in the sense that we just, the kernel will just take care of updating the hardware in between flow and the hardware is still that. We still have, this, have to have this callback to say to extend the flow to kind of. Yeah, I would expect, I would expect the, we would need, we would need uh, a, at least on the driver side, we would need a garbage collector just to, to go over, I mean, this hardware usually can come with, with some aging infrastructure, so you can just check in, in the registers if one of the entries has not seen packets for a while, and they would get rid of it, right? You mean, you mean that you're now getting that in sync with, with the timers you have in contract, right? No, it's a, I think there's like, there's this TCP connection that for three weeks, right? Um, eventually the contract entry will expire. Yeah. The hardware, then the the software would no longer age it, and so so it would be up to the driver to evict the flow on the software side, and that could be either via polling or it could get an event from the hardware. This. Yeah, either, either polling or either expecting events from the hardware. Yeah, I, I don't don't think that you want to manage all the timers in the hardware. So I think it's much better that the kernel will do polling in every time, a month. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's up to, uh, but it, it can come from the, from, the, from the kernel, not to do the, that's this, the driver, because that will be a code inside every driver yeah. that's, will impl that's implementing the polling. I think the polling can come from the upper layer, from the contract itself. Then he can also update his own table, and then the, um, the user space can can watch what's what's the current status because if the hardware is already get, got the fin and close this connection, I think the customer the, the user space uh, demon wants to see too. So that's and we don't want to have events for everything. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, okay, from a power usage, so uh, CPU pulling the CPU up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at this stage, what we have is that the the entry the entry in the connection tracking that has been offload has no timer. It's mm -hmm. it got this um, offload uh, status bit that has been set on, and and that basically means that 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 flow has been pushed into into the flow table. So it's a flow table that has to maintain the 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 timeout. We can we can provide we can provide an alien interface to the flow table, so we could we can inspect to see how the timers look like in in. With regard to what we have in in, in there, and so um, I, I agree that it would be good to have common infrastructure. If we can consolidate infrastructure for things that the drivers are going to repeat all all, all over all, again and again, again it, it's going to be better if we have it in a single place. So just the driver says, "I want poly mode or even mode," and just relay relay on some routine that is going to do it. For I think I, I would I would expect we we need a couple of drivers. At least or two, three, four drivers, and they will, we we can see what we can what we can consolidate. So, but yes, that that kind of helper functions would be good to have, depending on the approach that the driver follows, a event based or or pole based. Right. I think event uh, event based would be event based would be event based would be a problem because if we're talking about a problem that we are facing right now, that's customer are talking about millions of connections per second. Okay. So to handle those kind of uh, event, it will be a problem. So this, this is supposed to be a polling. It can't be a, something that will be we, event based. We, we could even do something like nappy, like if, if the number of events is too high. Yeah, but it's much more better to have a polling instead of if you want, because the, the user that is looking for on, the, on those tables is looking once a second, is not looking, you don't need to, to be event driven. Yeah. I, I'm personally, uh, personally, I'm, I'm going to worry about providing the infrastructure, and I, I will let the driver, people, to decide what they believe it's better for their hardware. I mean, for me, that's that should be fine. You're getting millions of connections per second. You're not worried about sleep states. Yes, but <laughs> but you want to do batching. You don't want to get notification for every connection. You you. Start the microphone every time. <laughs> so for every new connection, you must have an event. This is a new connection. But the garbage collector can be much more efficient. You don't need to get an event for every connection. Yes, but I don't want to double it to get all the... Okay. Uh, other topic? Uh, okay, good. So uh, I have a question regarding the wireless LAN support you briefly mentioned. Um, the, uh, I want to have a like, rough sense how much of support we are thinking of or the planning in the following... As, I, as everyone might uh, be aware, the wireless LAN ha protocol headers are pretty notorious in two ways. Number one is the fields are optionally or conditionally present. That's one. Yeah. Do I? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Thanks, Simon. All right. Thank you. Oh, this one is working. Thanks. So the, it is notorious in the following sense. Number one is the, uh, the fields are conditionally present or dynamically present. Second is the um, interpretation of each field is also dynamic. So I was wondering whether when you briefly mentioned the wireless LAN support in the, the filter, whether you are referring to the certain like IP, lab, IP tables level support or actually you were thinking of that dynamic support per packet. So you're thinking, you're thinking about, you're asking about uh, protocols that have uh, fields that are maybe present or not? 
That's right. So, so uh, that's the first uh, first uh, issue of the, the wireless LAN protocol, right? It can yeah. be there or not there, depending yeah. on the condition. Second is the even if it is there, we interpret that in a different way. Yeah. Uh, yep. So, from my Wi-Fi point of view, why would you ever run contract on a Wi-Fi frame? Why would you ever run contract on a Wi-Fi frame rather than the decoded Ethernet frame? I mean, where does this problem come in? The Ethernet level control is one, but it is after the convergence. So when you receive the, from the NIC, when we receive the Wi-Fi frame, then uh, I believe that we have a desire to control them because not every packet or transactions are coming from the Ethernet nowadays. I, I, I don't buy it. Um, <laughs> Because if you if you want to receive Wi-Fi frames, you have to do reordering. You have to do a whole bunch of things, and I I don't see how you can do anything like contract before you run your Wi-Fi stack. And once you've run all your Wi-Fi stack, you might as well just convert to the Ethernet frame to the 8023 format, and then run without all these problems. Understood. Then what is what do you mean by we support the wireless LAN in the the filter? What do you mean by that? I don't know. I don't. So, like so that was my original question. So, I, I'm okay. If you can, please share. Um, I mean, we are with the hooks that we have are basically on on the on, the, on um, are not going to see that kind of traffic, right? So, I mean, at ingress, it's so it's it's something that is staying behind the curtain of of the of the Wi-Fi stack. So it's not that we we are seeing those those details. Maybe I missed that. You yeah. said something about Wi-Fi. I didn't catch that. But um, yeah, I don't see how any of this could uh, even see Wi-Fi frames because they go away within the Wi-Fi stack before you get to the net div. So as far as the user is concerned, if they were to configure some sort of NAT or whatever across um, or anything like that across the uh, across the Wi-Fi interface, you would still configure it on the Ethernet layer that's exposed by the Wi-Fi stack to the net dev, right? So the net dev is still a regular 8023 frame, well, technically not 8023, but DIX frame format. So um, you you don't really see anything with the Wi-Fi specific stuff at that layer, and um, so I, I don't I don't think this question ever will ever be asked like how do you deal with all the Wi-Fi formats because you don't really don't want to deal with that um, and you can't at this point because you see at that la layer where this comes in you only see the Ethernet frames if you really want to control deeper down in Wi-Fi and I'm not sure why you would want to you have you have to do something else so I'm not really sure where the whole Wi-Fi thing came in in this discussion. Um, but I don't think it's relevant. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, could you could you pass the mic, please? Thanks. Another different topic at all. Um, we've been using and uh, enjoying the uh, BPF matcher for IP tables. So uh, a couple questions on that route. Um, first, is there? I understand it's not supported in NF tables yet. Or, uh, do you envision it being supported there? And two other questions. Um, it's currently a match option. So would you uh, consider um, or how would you see if we extended or uh, try to extend the uh, match capabilities, such as uh, the ability to match according to um, or to to use from uh, BPF in the match uh, access um, contract uh, state, for example, uh, like the destination uh, interface and on forwarding or something like that? And how would you uh, feel about or how? What do you think about uh, using BPF as a target uh, from NetFilter? 
Um, there is no support yet, but because no, no, no one has contributed. So if there is anyone willing to contribute that and has a valid use case, I don't I have no objections in general. I would like to know though what what kind of thing you, if possible, you're doing with with the BPF match in AP tables because now with NFT we have a different approach. So we basically have our own virtual machine. So um, probably it would be good to extend the instruction set that we have that is network specific to do what you need in and in a way that you, that we can express through some new extension. So depending on, on your use case, probably we can come up with something specific for NFT that can help you. Um, okay, we're, we're trying to leverage a lot of the work that's been done on BPF, for example, all the uh, uh, maps uh, that they're using uh, with all the sort of, uh, sorts of maps and hash tables, etc., that they're using um, to be able to control a, a very elaborate policy engine. Uh, from user space and being able to control it uh, and um, and consult uh, a database of maps that's populated by a process in the user space and uh, BPF is very helpful and very useful in that sense and it's very you know it's um, uh, we're leveraging all that work um, okay. so so that's the, the basic let's say that's the basic premise and uh, the ability to to use it as a target uh, would just be to, in order to be able, for example, to pass information from one BPF program to another, where you can't do that right now in uh, uh, in NetFilter because it's all only a match. It cannot set anything on the SKB and it cannot do any uh, modifications. Um, so yeah. we're trying to leverage all that power in uh, in NetFilter. I mean, uh, we have in NF tables we have uh, we have the native set infrastructure. So for all that list of uh, INET services, ports, I mean, IP addresses, whatever you have, any any tuple that we can build because we also support um, compounds. Uh, I, I would I would recommend you, you use the native infrastructure that we have to maintain all that because it's going to, uh, I mean, it's going to integrate well well with what we have, and and I don't see any reason why the, the set infrastructure that, that BPF has is going to run any faster. It's, it's basically C code as we have, so it's basically going to be the same, but we are going to have everything integrated through the same interface. So I would recommend that you that you use the, the native set infrastructure. Then um, regarding regarding actions, what kind of information do you want to pass between, between BPF programs? I'm quite in, um, curious about that. Um, for example, uh, one one program could do a classification, and the other could do policy. Okay. So uh, and they don't necessarily run at the same times on the same uh, on the same hooks or on. Uh, currently, we're using IP tables, but on different IP table criteria, we're running different programs, uh, and that's why we would like to be able to separate them. And currently, we're doing it. You know, we have to to tail call between different programs, and it's. It's uh, cumbersome, and uh, being able to pass information from one to the other makes sense to us. Okay, I mean, I would be very much. We, we can have a discussion offline if you like. I, I will be. I'm very interested in the in the use case, news cases. I mean, we can extend what we have to to support new new scenarios and new use cases. And I think I would I would prefer if we we have infrastructure that is generic and that it integrates well into what we have before we follow that path. Because I mean. Uh, for IP tables, the, B the BF match is basically uh, allowing quite a lot of flexibility in an infrastructure that is not flexible, actually. So, but with NFT, that we have our own virtual machine. Um, as I said, it makes sense that probably to extend the, the instruction set that we have, that is network specific, to a new, new, new f uh, functionality that can that uh, can allow people to do what, what they need. So, so let's talk. Let's talk now offline. Okay, thanks. So you're gonna you're gonna get the, the socket information all the time from the packets? No, we're talking about XDE. 
They match, they match for IP tables. Okay, I don't have any more material. Thank you very much.